So let me um, write down Ampere's law so that you know what it is. I mean, I'll be writing this down quite a few more times now. So it's named after Ampere, the guy that we have a unit of current named after. So Ampere's law says this. Um, you, cal you calculate uh, what's called a line integral of magnetic field. So uh, you have magnetic field, dot product with a DL. It's exactly what it looks like. That product between a magnetic field and some length of, um, of, I guess, it's just any path that you define. So um, now, because it's a DL, I have to add it all up. I have to have some kind of path and uh, imagine adding up all this quantity. And the kind of path that Ampere's law is valid for, it's a very specific type of path. We indicate it with this symbol. What kind of path do you think it must be? Closed the path. So this is the difference between a closed path and a, well, not closed path. This path represented by this wire right now, that's not a closed path. Um, it's, I have a beginning and an end. So that's not a closed path. Um, closed path is the one that has no beginning and no end. So this is a closed path. It has no beginning, um, there's no starting point, and there's no ending point. Yeah. Um, so I know it's a little bit too abstract, especially for lower division class. But this is the, how we define closed and open in topology. So when you have a closed surface, closed surface has no boundary. When you have a, I don't know, I have no closed surfaces here. Well, oh, oh this tennis ball, it has a closed path around it. Imagine you're standing on this tennis ball surface and ask yourself, where is the boundary of the surface? There is none. Once you poke a hole in it, then it's not a closed surface anymore, and the boundary is that hole. Okay. So, um, so yeah, so it has to be an integral over the closed path, and we don't really have a name for this quantity, other than that it's a line integral. It's exactly what it sounds like. And Ampere's law says that this line integral of magnetic field is equal to, um, mu naught, a constant, times current and closed. Um, what does it mean for a closed path like this to enclose a current? I mean, how do you, uh, so you know, imagine this is my current carrying wire. Like what would it, sorry, that there's a big glare coming from there. What would it mean for um, this closed path to enclose the current. It doesn't mean it in the sense that you are used to describing it for Gauss's law. So for uh, Gauss's law, it wasn't intuitively clear what it meant for charge to be enclosed. If you had this closed surface, enclosed charge would be inside the tennis ball, not enclosed charge would be outside the tennis ball. But um, at least in an in, at an intuitive level, it's less clear what it means for this loop to enclose the current. Because it's not as though current will be like, like what is it even enclosing? <laughs> um, so how would you, if you had to guess it intuitively, what would it mean for this current, which uh, comes in from somewhere very far away and will go out to very far away to be enclosed by this loop? that this would go around it, right? That's a fairly intuitive, right? Yeah, and if you want to make this mathematically rigorous, this is what it means. This current, as it's going through, it's going through some surfaces, right? We say that this current is enclosed. If it's going through a surface, which is an open surface, which is bounded by this closed loop. So right now, you could say this closed loop is bounding a circle. Right? And if this current goes through that circle, then it's an enclosed current. Yeah. Um, we have to talk a little bit uh, more about exactly the surface that this boundary is enclosing, but we'll do that, do that discussion towards the end of the semester, after your midterm three. Um, and uh, it comes down to this. Um, let's see. The choice of the surface that this bound is that unique. 
as in, can you pick only one surface that this closed path is bounding? And that's it. Um, you don't have to uh, worry about there being any other surfaces that's uh, being bounded by the same enclosed loop. Or is it the other way around where given one loop, there's many, many, almost infinite number of surfaces that this could be uh, enclosing. Let me draw this. So let me draw this side view here. If I have, um, if I have, uh, so this is the side view of the loop that you're looking at, right? So imagine this, like this is the side view of the loop that you're looking at. Um, so the closed surface that I was describing and most of you are imagining is the path that's uh, stretched over this as simply as possible. So that would be circle that's uh, sort of bound entirely within it here, right? That's what you're imagining. But let me draw a slightly different picture. Imagine that um, that circle, I keep start pushing on that uh, surface. So I stretch it out to make the circle look something like this. So, um, so you know, it's almost like a balloon. So is this surface still bounded by this the same loop? Or let me give you a more flexible surface so that it's easier for you to imagine. Um, balloon. So I have this balloon here. Can you tell me what's the path that enclosed the loop that bounds this open surface of a balloon? Like what's the, where is the boundary of the balloon? Yeah, the hole. This is the enclosed path that's uh, the boundary of the surface of a balloon. So right now the balloon that you're seeing is an example of one surface that's being bounded by this uh, thing. What if, um, I'll have to ask you to just imagine it. So you know, imagine I'm not pressing down on here, but this is all connected by a pipe. Is this surface still bounded by the same opening? Yeah, it is. So when you have a particular um, loop, it can bound many different surfaces. In fact, the simplest one here would be the, simply a circle that um, simply connects. But there's a many different surfaces of different shape that still ends on the same boundary. And uh, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but um, just uh, with uh, um, I'll just end with this saying that the fact that there's uh, these many different surfaces that can have the same boundary. For the purpose of, you know, there's the red surface that's bounded by this loop, the simple circular thing, and there's this green surface that's bounded by the same thing. For the purpose of Ampere's law, existence of this uh, infinite number of boundaries, or sorry, infinite number of uh, open surfaces bounded by this loop, is not a problem. Because you try to think of, okay, so you have this left-hand side which doesn't depend on the surface, Right hand side, which might depend on the choice of surface, but you look at, okay, how could that choice of surface change my current enclosed? As in, imagine a current passing through this, um, the, passing through this red boundary. Uh, could I somehow stretch out the surface in such a way that this current is no longer uh, bound? No, uh, this, uh, this current no longer goes through this uh, surface, even though it's uh, um, going through the red surface. Like, is that arrangement possible? No, right? I mean, this current, it has to go somewhere. If it co keeps going out to infinity, then at some point it's going to cross it. If it bends around, then it's going to cross it at some point here. If it bends around, makes a U-turn, then comes back up, then, oh, so this enclosed current must be a net current. So if there's current going in and then out, then that doesn't count. So the next step that we would have to do if we are imagining applying Ampere's law. So when you are applying Gauss's law, other than knowing what it is, um, to apply this to find the magnet, uh, sorry, electric field, what did you have to do? Like, you know, you had to have a symmetric setup and you had to do one more step before you could actually use this to find the electric field in some region of space. 
you have to define Gaussian surface, but there's something you have to do before that. And this is really the reason we don't start by we don't start electricity by um, by you know introducing Gauss's law. We started with the Coulomb's law instead of Gauss's law. Um, okay, I, I can see that we won't have time to finish this. So I'll describe it on Wednesday. We'll start out with this um, using these four geometries. So with the application of Gauss's law, this is what you had to know. You had to know what direction the electric fields were. If you didn't, then you were just dead in the water. You couldn't define Gaussian surface because how would you know exactly what shape it should be so that it's useful? So that's why we don't start introduction to electricity with this because Gauss's law doesn't tell you what direction electric fields are going unless you happen to be super genius at multivariable calculus and you are familiar with the divergence theorem and all that stuff. Um, we are going to do the same thing for magnetic field. So our interest here is once again the magnetic field, not the line integral. I don't care about the line integral. It's the magnetic field that, I, that we are interested in. So in order to, to find the magnetic field, we are going to have to define something that we are going to call Amperian loop. Like the Gaussian surface, it's going to be an abstract loop that you are using for calculation. It's not a loop of wire or anything. And for you to know, OK, what kind of loop is going to be useful for my calculation, you have to know the direction of magnetic field. You have to know how the magnetic field is oriented um, in each of these four geometries to apply Ampere's law to each of these four geometries to see, uh, OK, this is the loop we are going to define, which will help us find the magnetic field this way. 